Welcome to Aerial Services Mapping with Thermal Imaging, the first of three webinars in Aerial Services 2013 Summer Webinar Series. This is your host, Joshua McNary, Director of Corporate Development at Aerial Services. We are pleased you have joined us and hope you walk away having learned more about how to use thermal imaging for your geospatial applications. But first, a few housekeeping notes. One, you may ask questions via the questions pane on your screen. We'll collect these questions for responses from the presenter at the end of the presentation. Two, we want your feedback. Contact us via the chat or questions pane, or use the post-webinar survey to suggest any ideas or concerns regarding the webinar. Three, the post-webinar survey will be appearing on your screen after you leave the session. Please use that as an opportunity to share your feedback. Four, lastly, but not least, note that Aerial Services will be having an announcement soon about our fall webinar series. Also, don't miss our upcoming two summer webinars. You can visit www.aerialservicesinc.com slash webinars for more information and to register when the topics are announced. I'm now pleased to introduce my colleague and friend, Cornerstone Mapping's Aaron Sheppers, who will share his expert knowledge with you today. Aaron is president of Cornerstone Mapping, Inc., located in Lincoln, Nebraska. Aaron has been working with remote sensing and GIS for the past 16 years and is a certified GISP. He earned his master's degree specializing in remote sensing and GIS. He started Cornerstone Mapping over 10 years ago with a focus on remote sensing and aerophotography. Aaron is an intelligent mapper, creative hardware engineer, and expert in thermal imaging from the air. So with that, I am happy to turn the session over to Aaron, who will get us on with the show. Aaron, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Josh, and thank you for everyone jo joining us today. Uh, what I'd like to do is present a set of uh, slides with you that will talk about thermal imaging. What is the technology? How does it work? Then after we kind of get some background information on what the technology is and and what it means, what it, what we're talking about, then we'll get into some applications and you can kind of see some uh, neat looking pictures and applications and where you see, oh, this is how all this ties together and this is maybe how I can use it in my own applications. So with that, let's take a look at what thermal imaging is. Uh, heat is perceived to us, uh, or infrared, infrared energy is perceived as heat to us, and heat is a qualitative measure. So when you feel a, the heat coming off of a fire, it's, oh, that is warm. Or you touch, stick your head, hand in the refrigerator, that is cool. That's a qualitative sense. There's no temperature scale applied with that. But with heat, it is really a transfer of energy. And energy can be quantitatively measured with the special camera. And so with the special camera, we can actually measure how much heat is coming from an object. And so, and every object has its own spectral signature. And so whether you're looking at rooftops, vegetation, animals, houses, they all give us a heat signature that is different than what our eyes can see. To provide some background information on thermal in technology, it was originally developed by the military in the 1960s. And then it wasn't available commercially until the mid-1990s. And so this is a relatively young technology uh, that has now come over to us in the public sector that we can actually say, hey, let's use this camera and find these new applications. And in our case, we're using the thermal technology in aircraft for mapping. There are some myths that go along with thermal technology. And one of them is that it's not night vision. It's not the same as the green images you might see in the movies where they're, they have, they're wearing these big goggles and they're walking around and they can see people. That is really a magnification of light. Another myth that comes from Hollywood is the ability to penetrate walls and see people or objects on the other side of the wall. That is simply not something you can do with thermal technology. It's different. And that would be x-ray if you're looking to penetrate the walls or something. So to get a sense of where the, we fall in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, the 
part that we can see as humans is the blue, green, and red portion of the spectrum. And then for remote sensing applications, many multispectral cameras are capable of doing uh, four bands, say blue, green, red, and the near infrared, which extends out to about 1,100 nanometers. The thermal uh, is extending out to 3,000 to 5,000 nanometers and 8,000 to 14,000 nanometers. For shorthand, we call that 3 to 5 micron or 8 to 14 micron. And these are two atmospheric windows where the atmosphere is not absorbing the thermal energy, and therefore we can measure that with the thermal cameras. And so the 3 to 5 micron window is called mid-wave IR, and the 8 to 14 micron window is called long-wave IR. There are three categories of heat, and this is important to help understand what we can measure and how we can measure it. Uh, passive heat uh, will absorb and irradiate the heat as a, from a direct source, such as the sun. So a sidewalk is going to absorb the heat during the day from the sun and then start to re-radiate that heat. And so uh, this is something you can you'll know when you go out and walk barefoot onto the sidewalk. In the morning, it'll be cool, but in the mid-afternoon, it's a very hot source because it's absorbed a lot of thermal energy. An active source will be one that emits its own heat. This will be anything with metabolism, so people, animals, living organisms. But the heat that we emit is a very low strength of heat compared to a direct source of heat in which case that would be something that, like the sun, a fire, or a radiant heater that you plug into a wall. Now, there are three main methods in which heat will transfer from one object to another, and one is through conduction. This is where there is direct contact, where you put your, place your hand on an object, the heat will transfer from your hand to that object, or vice versa if the other object is warmer. So the, the transfer of heat is going to be from the warmer source to the cooler source. Convection is another means of transferring heat. And this would be like what you might find in a convection oven, where the warm air is passing over and around through the oven. And that is transferring heat that way. And then there's radiation. Radiation is a object such as the sun radiating the heat is moving electric magnetic, magnetic waves through the air. And then upon striking an object, that object will start to warm up, just like the case of the, uh, the sidewalk we discussed. And so we cannot see this energy as it travels through the air, only as it either is emitted from the object or as it strikes that object on the ground. And so with this information, we know that we can measure conduction and we can measure radiation heat. Um, the convection is something that we cannot measure because you cannot measure, you cannot see the energy moving through the air. Comparing the two wavelengths, mid, mid wave and long wave IR, each technology or each window has its uh, benefits and limitations. In general, you can say that the mid-wave IR is good for direct heat sources where you need to measure high temperatures. Uh, because it's a mid-wave camera, it's a shorter wavelength that uses a little bit different technology, and it has to be a cooled sensor. And so these, when, what I mean by a cooled sensor is there is usually a sterling cooler or liquid nitrogen flowing through the camera to keep that focal plane, the CCD in that camera, at a constant temperature. And then it can measure, as that, those energy waves are coming in and striking that CCD, it can uh, measure what those changes are in temperature. Uh, the challenge with mid-wave cameras, though, is if you want to use them outdoors, you can end up with uh, solar flares. This is essentially the equivalent of glint or uh, irregular sun illumination, for, like in a multispectral image. Long wave IR is good for passive and active heat sources. It's a non-cooled technology uh, called microbolometers. 
And so these cameras can be they're easier to manufacture, and they're also a lower cost uh, item. And so they can be used uh, for outdoor applications during the daytime because they're not subject to the solar flare because they're a, lo they're a longer wavelength, uh, 8 to 14 micron. So when do you want to collect thermal data? This is different than if you are flying typical multispectral imagery where oftentimes people say, oh, you should have 30 degree sun angle, uh, clear skies, and good conditions. Thermal mapping is different because we're looking for temperature differentials, not uh, quality of illumination. And so for that purpose, if you're looking at a rooftop and you want to measure the, how much, if there's any water penetration underneath the roof, this is something you would do after the sun sets. Because during the day, you'd have thermal loading, the rooftop is absorbing energy, and then as that energy starts to dissipate at different rates due to wet or dry material, that could be measured. So let's say if you want to do uh, energy heat loss assessments or counting wildlife. Well, for these, you're looking for maximum temperature differentials. And you would not want to fly during the day because your air temperature is going to be warm and any heat radiating from an animal or from a building is also going to be warm and therefore it would be harder to detect the differences. And so you would fly at night where you have as cool of a temperature as possible to optimize the uh, differences between your object and the uh, surroundings. And another example is maybe for uh, water, water quality of streams and rivers. This is something you would uh, probably do during the daytime because the temperature is not dependent on a radiant absorbing energy from the source. You're looking at the water temperature that is going to be influenced by perhaps water pollution. Say you have industries located along your river. They take in cool water, use the water for their process, and then they put the water back out into the river. That would be a good application where you could fly that during the day. Uh, for thermal imagery, it's important to keep in uh, concept this idea of thermal effects. And what it is is this crossover, temperature crossover from morning to night. As the uh, sun rises, the air temperature will rise throughout the day, and then as the sun sets, it will uh, decrease again. Well, the ground temperature will also do the same thing, but at a different rate, because the ground will warm up and cool down differently than air temperature. And likewise for water. Water will warm up and cool down at a different rate than ground temperatures, or ground objects. And during these warm up and cool down periods, we effectively end up with these periods where we have thermal crossover, where the temperature between the ground and the water are very similar, essentially the same. And those would be two time periods that you would not want to fly a certain project because it's about maximizing thermal differentials, not looking for similarities. Let's take a look at some of the older technology and then how that leads us into the newer technology. The older technology was based on analog uh, keep, uh, systems, where the systems would show you a hot to cold temperature scale, typically black and white, where white would be warm and uh, black would be cool. And when you look at this example picture, we can see that there's a bunch of little white dots throughout the screen. Well, those are rooftops. Uh, and so they're, they're showing up as hot. And then we have agricultural fields, kind of a medium gray. Uh, darker gray areas are uh, forested areas. And so they have a different signature than a bare soil area. And then the river, river showing through here is dark because it's, uh, it's colder water. And so with the older technology, we were limited to uh, overlaying our GPS position just as it's shown there, is oftentimes a black bar with a whole bunch of numbers scrolling across. And then if you dissect that information, you could figure out where that image was taken. But beyond this, it was very difficult to take it to a mapping level 
because the, the array size is very, very small at 320 by 240 pixels. If you try to georeference an image like this, you can do it one by one, but how do you, what happens if you start flying lower and lower and you cannot find enough unique features to georeference an image? A challenge also is that with uh, the low signal to noise ratio, the imagery can get to be grainy and your sensitivity of the camera is affected. And so you may be only looking at a few degrees sensitivity, which might not be good enough for certain applications. You might not be able to even see the signature you're looking for. And then also the cameras have the limited features, such as the GPS stamp overlay. Uh, the ability to trigger camera uh, didn't exist uh, back in the mid-1990s for the thermal technology. With the latest technology, the cameras are radiometrically calibrated, and we can have the sensitivity down to better than 0.1 degrees Celsius with a very large dynamic range. And this, uh, for certain cameras, it can be from negative 40 degrees Celsius to 300 degrees Celsius. And with that, that gives us the ability to map all sorts of objects on the ground. So maybe you're flying over a power plant that is generating lots and lots of heat, but it's cold outside. You, the camera will accurately map the differences between the hot and cold areas. And then as a post-process, because the data is digital, uh, correction factors can be applied to compensate for the ambient air temperature, the relative humidity, and what we call emissivity. It's basically the ability of an object to absorb energy and re-radiate, and every object has a different emissivity value. And so that's a very important key to keep in mind when uh, processing data for thermal technologies. And then with the dig digital camera systems, we have the ability to feed in GPS uh, information, uh, interface with an IMU, the initial measurement unit, keeping track of the roll pitch and yaw of the camera. We can trigger the camera at precise photo centers, and then we can also see a live video feed for quality control. As a comparison of the image resolution, it, uh, we looked at uh, 320 by 240 pixels. It's a very, very small camera array. It's difficult to do any mapping with, uh, but it was commonly used for law enforcement where you're looking for a, uh, a fugitive running on the ground or a car chase. You could use it for an application like that, but beyond those capabilities, it was difficult to integrate into mapping. And so what we have now are what I'll we'll call medium resolution cameras, uh, 640 by 480 pixels, which equates to about a 0.7 megapixel camera. Uh, compare that to what a, a common camera you buy at your local store, this is still a very, very small resolution. But it is practical and usable for uh, mapping applications. And then there is the high definition camera that was just becoming available this year that is uh, 256 times larger than the, the reasonable medium form, medium resolution camera at, uh, with the swath width of 1,024. That's almost double the swath width, which is very uh, great for us as a flyer because that means we can reduce the number of flight lines we fly for a project. Here's an example of the medium or standard resolution and the high definition resolution. I've installed both of these cameras side by side in the airplane to do uh, some system checks, compare the different camera systems. And we can see the footprint is significantly larger on the high definition camera. And, uh, the example image that we're showing here is a hospital. And so there, there are some warm areas and cool areas. And so the, there's a good application for thermal mapping. So what are some practical resolutions that we can fly with thermal imagery? And here I put together a basic table. Uh, there's no hard and fast rules when it comes to doing these projects. It is just like doing a multispectral project. You look at what's the purpose of the project, what's practical in terms of data acquisition, and what, what's available for funding and define the happy medium through all of that, and then you can decide, okay, this resolution will fit for this project. 
So for an example, a flat roof assessment where we are looking at an individual, uh, maybe a big box store, you can fly at a lower altitude. And if you look across the bottom, there's a flying altitude for a 50 millimeter lens at 2,000 feet. And that will give us, with a standard resolution camera, 640 foot swath. So it will be a difficult fit to make the entire image or entire building fit into that image, just like that previous example I showed you at the hospital. I, uh, another practical application at one foot resolution is subsurface steam lines. Um, with that technology, we'll show some examples later on uh, of many of these different applications. What I want to do is just kind of give you an idea that uh, six inch imagery for thermal is really not very practical. You can do that, uh, but your field of view is only 320 feet on the ground. And when an airplane's flying 150 knots and you're trying to stay within, you know, say, 50 feet horizontal and roll into banking, you're almost sure to clip part of your object that you're trying to capture. And so uh, that, that's why I have a one foot, essentially a minimum in there. And then we can go with the higher you fly, you can capture a larger and larger area. So for example, if you look at an agricultural field um, in the Midwest, those are typically a quarter section, which is a half mile by half mile. And you can capture an entire quarter section with one frame flying at 13,000 feet over the ground. And so here are some examples to kind of give you an idea, um, kind of get the gears turning where these are some things you can do. Uh, for agriculture, you can look at uh, variability within the field, some problem areas. Uh, we can detect uh, pinpoint pollution in water. We can look at interchannel water temperatures as well and how that might uh, affect the ecology. Uh, looking at uh, building heat loss, um, and those are all applications. A few more applications include uh, going underground, looking at the, the steam lines. Uh, you can detect wildlife for mapping applications and uh, rooftop assessment like we've already discussed. So can we use thermal imagery in GIS? The simple answer is yes. Uh, the workflow that I've created allows us to take the digital technology from the camera orthorectify, stitch it together as a mosaic, and deliver it as a standard GeoTIFF product. What this allow means for the end user is the ability to bring it into any GIS platform. And then when you do, it will come in as a black and white image because there's only one data layer. It's all it's temperature values. And then you can apply a color ramp and say in ArcGIS, whatever program it might be, you might choose to do a rainbow color effect or a uh, warm is red and blue is cold, uh, a color ramp like this. And so there are uh, different uh, things you can do with that. And what's nice about the digital technology is wherever you place that pixel, your uh, identify tool on the, on the image, it will show you the actual temperature value. And that means you can start doing quantitative analysis with your data set instead of just a visual assessment. Here's an example of a thermal image for rooftop assessment, a flat roof overlaying on top of a three-inch orthophoto in the background. And the interesting to look, thing to look at here is there's four squares on this building, and this square that I'm pointing to shows a, a different effect. So the question is, well, why is that there? Well, the initial uh, assumption might be that there is an inadequate uh, amount of insulation in that uh, quarter of the roof. So maybe during construction, something was different than the other three quarter, quarters of the roof. But then also, if you look to the top of the roof, we have an area that's red. So well, why is that there? It's hard to interpret some of the features on this image. And so you can say, well, can I use that imagery in the background to help enhance the features of the thermal image? And there are a couple of ways to do this. And one method is to use pan sharpening. Uh, the alternate method, which would be very similar uh, for the similar effect, would be to use the transparency of the thermal. So you can see or show that 
uh, quick daytime image through the, the uh, thermal. And now what we see is during where this area is red, you can see those are parking lot stalls. And it happens to be that this is a, a, a building, commercial building, with a large window pane across the parking lot area. And so now we can conclude that there's a significant amount of energy being radiated out through those windows, and we can measure that because it's warming up the concrete, and then we're measuring from the concrete. And so that's one application. And then we can also look at some of these other pinpoint areas. And some of those are roof bends, and some of those are anchor points for, for an antenna that's located on top of the building. And so there, there are lots of neat, unique features that you can find. Another example in the same image is this house here, or this building. It, it doesn't look like there's a house, but there's a bright yellow spot, meaning there's heat radiating from there. And if we look at the pan sharpened image, we can see clearly see the roof lines and determine that it's not a flat building roof, rather it is a, uh, art, a pitched roof style construction. Uh, the challenge also with a, using the daytime image and this thermal image was taken at night was objects on the ground may be in different positions. Uh, so this would be for the cars where we see a car here showing through on the pan sharpened and it's not visible in the thermal. Or if we look at some of the locations of the cars in the parking lots, some of them have moved. Here's another example of a, a leaking roof. And so instead of a lack of insulation, like in the previous example, this is one where we have water that is penetrating the roof. And what happens is during the day, the sun is thermal load, thermally loading the rooftop. And a, the dry roof is going to warm up at a different rate than the wet portion of the roof. And this is subsurface uh, water moisture that's uh, oftentimes uh, below a tar paper or uh, a rock surface. And then during the nighttime after the sun goes down, the areas that are wet will retain heat, whereas the rest of the roof will dry down or cool off more quickly. And so this is an application where you can use thermal imaging to detect those problem areas. And then coincidentally, on the same uh, image here, we have two entrances. And this building is a, uh, uh, a public high school. And so we can see this one building is radiating a lot of heat compared, or this door, compared to this other door over here, which appears to be more efficient than the other door. Other door. So then you can start to assess, well, why is that? Did they have a, a meeting that night? Maybe there's a, a basketball game. Uh, maybe there's something different. But we can see at the bottom of the image these latent patterns in the ground. You see there's one car here that's still radiating heat, and all those other shadows, so to speak, are where a car was sitting on the concrete absorbing the energy, and now that the vehicle is left, the concrete is re-radiating that heat. So now we've looked at some of the features above ground, let's go underground and see what we can see there. Uh, here's an example of a prison complex, a state penitentiary with a steam network throughout the, the uh, facility for distributing heat to each of the buildings. Uh, this mosaic here has about 80 images all stitched together, uh, orthorectified. And using direct georeferencing technology, meaning a airborne GPS with an uh, inertial measurement unit, we can direct uh, georeference and mosaic all these images without any ground control. And we can see that the Directly georeferenced thermal imagery is lining up very nicely with the existing color orthophotography in the background. And then if we go and look at a zoomed in portion of this, we can see where the steam network is. And we have a the faint white lines are the steam lines underground. And the steam lines are approximately three feet um, below the surface. And we can draw a uh, profile line to measure the heat. And that is what this graphic is below, where there's a spike wherever there's a heat loss. And there's heat loss throughout this network. So the idea is, well, what's causing that heat loss? 
And what we can do then is start thinking through this again and we identify areas like well if there's heat loss it's probably because there's either a leak in the joint or maybe a lack of insulation. But it's interesting that wherever we typically see uh, extra heat loss is in a joint. And, and so that means that's a, a weak link in the overall infrastructure of buried uh, steam lines. Here's an example of mapping uh, wildlife. This imagery is a uh, half meter spatial resolution. And wherever you see these white dots, those are the deer in the field. And if we draw a profile through these white dots, you can see that the temperature spikes up. And if there's a double spike, kind of like a camel's back, oh, well, there's two animals side by side. And because this is digital camera technology, we can take this information and run it through a simple classification system, which would then identify each of these warm spots as an animal, and then you can do animal counts using the thermal imagery. Another application is using thermal imagery for agriculture. And looking at the example on the right-hand side, we can see that each of these fields has different in field variability. The, the top field has uh, horizontal streaking going through the field with some irregular patterns. The next image down has um, uh, darker blue rings, which are indicative of something is wrong with the irrigation system. Uh, the next field down is showing to be much warmer than the other fields. You can say, oh, well, they are behind the irrigation schedule and therefore their crops are suffering and will have yield loss. And then this bottom field appears to be in pretty good shape, where except for maybe a couple little rings here and there that could be eas easily fixed by the farmer. Here's an example of uh, what we call surge irrigation. Uh, what that means is the, there's pipes laying on the ground and the uh, water is flowing through the field downhill with gravity. And so that yet for these types of fields, you need a very flat field. And the surge irrigation comes from the idea that you turn on part of the field, let the water start going down, and then you turn those, that part of the pipe off and you turn on the other part. And so the areas that are blue in color have recently, recently been irrigated, and the orange part is warmer because it hasn't been irrigated yet and the, and the crops are a little bit stressed. So what's interesting is the water flow is from the top left to the bottom right. And then we see this orange area. It's like, well, that's a high spot. So this is a problem for the farmer because that means the water is not penetrating through the field to get to the area, and that crop is being water stressed now. And the water flow is coming down through the field and backfilling as far as it can. So the solution for the farmer would be to go in and do some land leveling just on that area to help that water pass through. And therefore, he, in the future, he would start seeing higher yields because it, that spot would not be water stressed from the lack of irrigation. Here's an, another example it is a center pivot. The pivot is this dark blue line. It is running at the time. And it's dark blue because it is cold. And the temperature range that we are looking at is red is hot, blue is cold, and the pivot is moving counterclockwise. And we can tell this because behind the pivot is cooler in temperature than in front of the pivot. The key feature to look at here are the first couple of rings that you see on the inside of the pivot are a warmer color than the rest of the field. And what this means is that the pivot has uh, the wrong, incorrect nozzles placed on those portions of the top, what we call a tower. And the pivot has different size nozzles for the inside rings versus when you get to the outside of the pivot. Because the pivot's moving faster at a faster rate on the outside, therefore it needs a larger nozzle to put out more water. Ideally, this is a calibrated system and you wouldn't have the variability that you see. Uh, we can clearly see that there's a temperature difference of 84 degrees to 76 degrees, so about the 8 degree temperature difference of the crop. 
And that is very significant and would lead to a very high yield loss for the farm. Another example is a field where we can also see the pivot running. It is uh, the, the dark blue line. Uh, the orange line here is a access road, so there's no crops growing there, and therefore it's, it's showing hot. And so the pivot is moving this counterclockwise, or clock, or I'm sorry, counterclockwise, and the nozzle here is clogged, meaning it's not putting out the full rate of water or no water at all. And so that those crops are burning up and turning into leaves and curling. And then as the pivot goes around, you can see that the uh, that clogged nozzle appears to be diminished, but the damage is already done. Uh, the, the crop has already suffered a yield loss. And these are the types of problems that can be detected earlier in the growing season before they're visually apparent to, the, to a crop scout. And so if you can catch problems early and fix them, the farmer uh, easily can pay for the imagery uh, which is great because this is also a year after year problem because the nozzle will always remain clogged or the incorrect nozzle package will always be on the pivot until it's resolved. Continuing on with the idea of using thermal imaging in agriculture is the, uh, on the left image we're looking at a orchard area uh, where they have different watering rates you can see on the left, there's two rows of imagery or two rows of trees that are much warmer than this middle set of trees. And then the two rows on the right have a higher uh, irrigation rate. And these are readily detectable because what happens is with plants is they go through evapotranspiration as part of photosynthesis. And if the plant becomes sick, they're actually very much like a human. If humans become sick, our, our body temperature rises. The same thing with vegetation. If a plant becomes sick because of a, a lack of, uh, of water, the, it closes up and, be, and it cannot breathe in, anymore, essentially. It closes its windows, and instead of bringing in carbon dioxide and expelling water and oxygen, it's no longer expelling water, and with water it carries heat. And so when it closes up, it starts to build up internal heat on the plant. And it's easily mapped this way. And on the right is an example of a, a waterway running through the middle of a golf course. Uh, this could be any kind of waterway. And if you're looking for point pollution, maybe it's a, uh, a drainage way for a water runoff. And you want to make sure that it's not adversely affecting the, the local ecology. And so that's a kind of an interesting application. And leading into that is more of a larger scale application of thermal pollution. So here we have a, a FSA imagery in the background, one meter color. And the uh, imagery is collected at night. Uh, there's about 500 images in this mosaic that collected at one foot image resolution. And the idea was looking for pinpoint pollution, either in the water, or in the river, or in the lake area for the waterfront communities. And the camera was able to pick up a couple of different problem areas that we can go look at and investigate. And so the camera technology is very sensitive and can pick up these differences if they're there. But what's also interesting about looking at this picture is you'll see on the waterfront property in the upper left-hand corner, it is warmer with blue, and in the lower right, it is orange. I mean, it's cooler with the blue and warmer with the orange. And the water flow for the river is from the upper left to the lower right. Uh, what this means is that there's hydraulic pressure of water flowing under underground, because it's going to be a very shallow water table close to the river. And so the areas that are to, in the blue up here are going to be recently cooled because that water is flowing out from the soils. And then it's uh, warming up as it's been in the lake longer and uh, the sun has been warming the surface. But then there's also a little branch here that shows very cool water. Well, it's a very narrow channel compared to the other areas surrounded by, soil, by land. And so it's interesting to be able to uh, 
identify these kinds of features in the local ecologies that it would have um, on the plants and uh, wildlife. Here's a larger uh, citywide project. Uh, the project was uh, designed for a 42 square mile area for energy heat loss was the purpose of the project. And so we wanted to fly the entire city and the surrounding areas to map residential and commercial buildings. Uh, we flew at uh, half meter imagery, which put us at 3,200 feet over the ground. And there are over 5,400 images for this project. And each image was taken at an interval of uh, 0.8 seconds. So that means the camera system is firing very quickly and the need to stay directly on the flight line is extremely important so that you don't end up with data gaps. Here's an, a mosaic of that entire data set. It looks like a traditional black and white image. In this case, a, the warmer areas are white and the cooler areas are, are darker black. And as we zoom into the area, we can see that we actually can start to see unique patterns. Uh, this small area of 15 images is mosaic together and it doesn't look like uh, the, the past work of imagery. And that's the important part of the camera system being a radiometrically calibrated, and my system is also geometrically calibrated, meaning it's removing the distortion from the lens. And what we see here are some building, rooftop buildings that are cooler temperatures, so they're black, but then you see areas of kind of a white halo around some of the buildings. And where there's a white halo is the area of higher heat loss, uh, oftentimes from a rotating door, if it's a commercial building, or think of an emergency room entrance to a hospital. Those doors are always opening and closing. They, they're radiating a lot of heat, and that can be detected in the imagery. Uh, if you look at the bottom picture, on the portion of that right picture is you see one half of the building, the area is fairly dark and cool compared to the rest of the building. So is that, does that mean there's different construction techniques or maybe uh, they're not using that, the east wing of that building? And so those are questions that could be uh, looked at more closely to, to determine if there's any energy savings by updating windows or improving the installation of a building. But how do you take something like this and pick, kind of accelerate the image interpretation? Well, you could bring that into a GIS and clip out the thermal imagery with building footprints. And now you can start to see the patterns only of the buildings and not of the, the background, the trees, the soil, the roads. You just take away all the extraneous information and you have the opportunity to then cut out and evaluate on a quantitative basis what's the average temperature for each of these buildings. And if you take this to a residential area, so you can look at it for a house by house, you can say for this neighborhood, we'll make some assumptions that they are made of similar materials during the same similar time period. So maybe they are all built during the 1970s. So you know that they all have a, a more or less standard construction. And then you can start comparing house to house and look at the statistics and then you can find some houses that are maybe a little bit warmer than they should be. And if they're warmer than they should be, the question is why are they warmer? And it could be, well, maybe they were having a house party that night and therefore the elevated temperature. But if you, start, if you can rule out all those variables and say it's under normal conditions, then you can uh, maybe start to uh, justify going in and doing a ground-based assessment to look for leaky windows, leaky doors, and uh, inadequate insulation. And this is important for uh, utility companies because when you look at the overall energy consumption of a city, that is important to the utility company because it means that they have to keep up the uh, supply of energy, whether it's natural gas or electricity, to meet the needs of the consumer. And if the consumer can scale back on how much energy that they need, the utility companies do not need to grow as rapidly. And that means they might be able to uh, put off a $10 million expansion several years down the road 
Well, that saves money for the utility company and ultimately money for the consumer. But on the other side, too, is the idea, well, this saves some money for the consumer. And there's an idea of energy poverty in which you can have the uh, homeowner, which may be, if they're in a under-insulated home, they're going to be paying higher energy bills, and the lower-income people often pay a higher energy bill, which is a higher percentage of their uh, annual revenue. And so that makes it difficult for them to um, to live in the home because of the constant drain of the cost of utilities. So I, I went through more in-depth uh, analysis of that, just to kind of give you an idea that you could actually take this data and apply it uh, at many different levels and come up with useful analysis. And so with that, I'm going to conclude our uh, webinar today. And, and I'll uh, let you um, please, uh, type in any questions that you have, and I'll be happy to address those. Thanks, Aaron. That was a very informative and uh, useful presentation. We appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. All right. Thank you, Josh. And I know uh, we here at our services are uh, pleased to be working with Aaron. and. Uh, Considering many of these interesting applications that Thermal can bring to the table as the technology uh, continues to mature. So, uh, thanks, Aaron. So we will go right into some questions. We've got a number of them that have come in during the presentation, Aaron. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with some of their questions. OK. So the first thing I'm going to uh, ask is, um, do we need any specific software applications to process or view this thermal imagery? Uh, the, the short answer is no, because uh, the the way that I process the imagery is in such a way that it takes the proprietary file format from the camera system, I ingest it, I process, I apply the camera calibrations, and then I do orthorectification. And as part of that, the output is a standard GeoTIFF. And the GeoTIFF can be read by virtually any GIS platform, or you can even uh, load in that GeoTIFF to Photoshop or a photo editor. So it's designed to be very user-friendly uh, on your end. OK. Um, we had a question here about stereo. Can the images be used in stereo mode, uh, provided the stereo pairs have been acquired for to produce some kind of 3D thermal information? Is this used? Have you ever used it? Um, and what about the accuracy of that 3D information, if it is possible? Mm -hmm. In general, I'm going to say that the, the thermal cameras are not a metric system. Um, there are no metric thermal cameras out there because there's really never been a need for that. And like I said, the technology is relatively young compared to traditional uh, photogrammetry, whether it's digital systems or analog systems. And so to do stereo applications for thermal imagery, I would say it's going to be marginal at best, just because the, the, the system calibration and the stability would not lend itself well to photogrammetry. Um, but it is stable to the point where you can create quality ortho photos. OK. Um, we have a question here about uh, regarding cost. There was a specific uh, inquiry on thermal versus LIDAR. Uh, can you give us some kind of comparable uh, as costs go between those two technologies. They are different technologies, but on cost, is thermal cheaper, more expensive than uh, thermal, or vice versa? Uh, that's a, a worse than comparing uh, apples and oranges, uh, because the technology is very different. And there can be so many different variables you're looking at in terms of uh, the point density for LiDAR versus the spatial resolution for the thermal. In general, the thermal technology will cost more than traditional uh, aerial photography, and that's because the footprint is relatively small. So if you're looking at flying a, a one-foot project of a city for regular color imagery, it would cost more because we have more flight lines to figure out to fall, fly. And because of, instead of, uh, say, about 10,000 pixels swap on a mapping system, where even on the latest and greatest thermal camera, you only have 1,000 pixels which rough math tells you that you're going to have more than 10 times as many flight lines. And then there's also going to be additional in-office processing because you have more frames to process. Uh, at this point, we don't. there's no hard and fast rules to say it's going to be in the similar ballpark as LiDAR acquisition, because I'm not sure that that's uh, there's, uh, not necessarily true, 
for one, and two, I don't know that there's enough one-to-one uh, -one comparisons to try and group them together. Okay. I had a number of questions here from Brian. Um, I think with regards to your uh, showing of the citywide data, so how many mm -hmm. nights did it take to collect that data is the first question. Uh, I was very fortunate in that I was using a, a fast aircraft. I was using a Piper Saratoga. And so data acquisition was at about 145 knots. And, and I also took off from the airport that was located right at that airport. So aside from mobilization, from wheels up to wheels down, it was about four hours of just constant flying, uh, keeping the turns nice and tight so that you're not spending excess uh, time around the corners. And the airplane had about four and a half fuel hours worth of fuel on board. If using a different aircraft, uh, that could be a different scenario. If you have to fly higher altitude or whatever the different variables are, you could end up spending several nights. Uh, but the conditions were perfect for that acquisition. Uh, related question, I believe, uh, to that one is how do you, the temporal temperature differences affect your ability to uh, create a radiometrically proper mosaic of all those images together? The thermal camera is very stable, and so that uh, you don't need to generally color balance your imagery. I put that in quotes. Because with uh, traditional imagery, you, there's a need to color balance because the sun angle is always changing. But if you're flying thermal imagery, you're not measuring the reflectance of light. You're measuring the emittance of energy. And so you, you move that variable from that equation of uh, the mosaic. Uh, the other part of that question then is how do you calibrate the imagery to absolute temperature? And the way you would do that would you, if you wanted to calibrate the imagery, you would need to have uh, thermal couples or basically a thermometer on the ground of different top, uh, different objects. So if you look, if you're interested in the concrete, you'd want to have targets on the concrete, and measuring those, you'd have to have a GPS uh, position. Think of it as ground control, except for instead of a target, you're you're having a, a, a thermometer at that location, and then you can calibrate and also factor in the atmospheric conditions. But ultimately, though, I don't know that there's a lot of strong need for calibrated thermal imagery if you're looking for thermal differentials. Because when you calibrate the imagery, it's more, more likely just to be a linear shift up or down to match your calibrated temperature values. Uh, your, the relative values from pixel to pixel are not going to be different. So if you have a difference of 2 degrees between this pixel and that pixel, it's still going to be a 2 degree shift after calibration, assuming a linear uh, calibration shift. Uh, so it might be an additional expense that's not necessary or warranted, depending on the application. Aaron, are you going to share what sensor you're using and perhaps add uh, some context to any other sensors that are available out there right now? Sure. Uh, the system that I, I'm using is uh, every, all the components are commercial off-the-shelf uh, pieces. And so as part of that, you need a Airborne GPS 9 u which I use uh, one from Aplanix, and a uh, flight navigation system, which I use uh, Tracker flight navigation. And then the thermal sensor itself is a Genoptic camera. Uh, they're a German-based company. And what I did is I did the, all the system integration to make each of those components talk with each other. And then it, was, it, it works like a, a media, a, 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 standard mapping system except for it has a thermal camera. So I make that sound simple, but it takes a lot of time and effort to make that integration happen. Uh, but having said that, uh, you can go out and buy a, a thermal camera and just run it as a video camera aircraft if you wanted. Uh, but how do you georeference, like this project I talked about for the citywide mapping, how would you georeference 5,000 images by hand? It would take you a year to do that, and uh, the people, your employees are just going, how are you doing that? Um, Aaron, how do you interpret heat loss from the side of a building as opposed to the roof? That's a, a good question because the heat loss from the side of the building, uh, if you remember, we can't measure heat radiating through the air. Uh, it has to be uh, emitting from an object. And so if you're losing heat from a window, a side window, that heat is actually warming up the ground in front of it. And then you're measuring that energy from the ground to the camera. 
And so you know that it kind of looks like a halo. That halo is really a radiation of energy from the window to the ground and then up to the camera. Um, now, as far as looking at the sides of, of a building, you could certainly do that. Um, I don't know that it would be very effective from the aircraft just because of the resolution and the, uh, the angles. Uh, but there are companies that do mobile-based thermal mapping. Uh, and then you can map the, all the entire sides of a building from the street level. And that would give you the detailed information that you might need, be looking for. Great. Is there any open thermal data available that perhaps people can play with? I do have a, the, the citywide data set. It is available on a uh, internet map server. And so that information can be pulled directly into ArcGIS and people can play with that data set. Uh, a caveat with that data is that it's, in order to make it internet friendly, it, the values have been converted from a temperature value to a, uh, a a stretched value, so white is warm, black is cold, and so. But the temperature differential, the patterns are all the same. You just can't click on a pixel and get that. So we can look at a way to uh, send that link out to people, and they could uh, evaluate that. And there's also a certain six-inch imagery that you can download with that as a backdrop. Um, that data set we can make available. We can. Uh, we will be providing the slides as well as a video version of this webinar to all of you who are attending. So uh, perhaps on that page that we will provide you, we can include the connection information that Aaron's speaking of. OK, yeah, that'd be fine. Uh, we have a number of other questions here. We're going to continue on and try to get these in before the end of the hour. and might go over just a little bit. But I uh, want to make sure we address all these for our attendees. Could you locate buried drain tile through farm fields with this technology? I've done some preliminary investigation with that uh, idea, the concept, and the, the answer is yes and no uh, from what I've been uh, able to, de to determine so far. Uh, part of that has to do with uh, the current soil profile, how full of water it is at the time, but I think the timing is going to be important and then also the age of the drain tile. Uh, so I think it, it needs further research to determine if it's a viable tool. But I have seen, I have some success of identifying drain tiles that were not readily visible or apparent in a multispectral image. And so it's an interesting concept, and it, like I said, warrants more research in that area. Have any large electrical utilities used your services for heat loss from transformers? Uh, that is a common application for uh, on the ground base. Uh, like here in Lincoln, the local utility company has a van equipped with thermal technology, and they drive all the neighborhood streets, and they point the camera from the ground up to the power lines and the transformer looking for problem areas. Uh, but that is something that would be far more difficult to do from the air, especially in the aircraft. You would probably want to do that from a helicopter. Um, so part of it is going to be a challenge of spatial resolution and making sure you can stay centered over that those uh, the power lines. And so there are companies that do that. Um, to what degree of success they have, I, I'm not sure. Is there a quick and easy way to correct for different types of uh, emitters, such as different roof types? So you have two different roof types next to each other that perhaps will look different temperatures, but and perhaps um, give a false, false positive on one being more uh, heat loss than another? Uh, what it sounds like he's referring to is are two different objects, let's say um, a synthetic object and a, uh, a natural object. And so that might lead to what we call emissivity, so how well an object absorbs and re-radiates energy. Normally on a large data set, you'd have, you just have to pick your typical object that you're looking at and say my emissivity is going to be 0.98 or 0.9 or whatever the value is and everything will be adjusted to that value. Uh, right or wrong. Uh, the idea to correct an image within or an object within an image requires additional post-processing. It could be done through modeling. It would be considerably more expensive because you would have to match or map every single feature on the ground and then uh, have separate polygons which then you would assign a emissivity value and recalibrate the imagery or recorrect the imagery. So it could be done. Uh, how 
how viable it is, I'm not sure, other than maybe on a building per building basis. Okay. How do you correct for the data uh, for ambient temperature or relative humidity during the press processing? Uh, that goes back to the question I answered earlier. Uh, it's related to how do you calibrate the imagery. And the way to do that is you would want to know what, the, you just have data loggers logging what the ambient temperature was at the time of data acquisition and relative humidity if you, if you want to make those corrections. And then at the time of conversion from the camera raw data file into a uh, output file, those parameters will all be applied to that imagery. So emissivity, relative humidity, and ambient temperature can all be entered into that, that equation. And so it, it has to be done, though, before you get into the, the georeferencing and post-processing steps. OK. have a few more questions here listed and uh, a few more coming in. If you have any last-minute questions, I would suggest you send them in now. Uh, while you do that, we'll continue on with our next one. Have any large timber or timber management companies used your services for wildlife detection? Uh, there are. The short answer is no. Uh, we would have to maybe look at that uh, in terms of what kind of wildlife you're looking to map. Uh, you have to be realistic that you're not going to be able to do a map a sparrow. Uh, you can map larger animals, such as, uh, I'll say, a deer or anything larger, like elk or moose. Uh, those are all uh, potential possibilities. Um, but I have not provided those services to any companies for that application. OK. So what effect does wind speed over a given target have on determining when a project is flown? Should imagery be acquired in calmer conditions? Or is there a way to account for the effects of wind? Does it affect the temperature or the thermal uh, footprint that you pick up? Uh, that's a very good question. I the thermal imagery needs to be flown under relatively slow wind speed. So ideally, uh, less than 10 knots, maybe 15 knots. I should put that in miles per hour, 10 to 15 miles per hour. Uh, if you go faster or higher wind speed than that, you can end up with smearing. It's kind of like when you're driving down the road on an asphalt, you see this wavy mist coming off the road. You'll get the same effect, except for uh, it'll be off of a warm object over a cool object. You'll see the streaking. It's kind of like a wispy wind effect over your objects. You'll still see the general pattern that is there, but you have this additional wispy noise that's over top. Uh, and depending on the application, that can be a problem. And so it's advised to fly thermal imagery under uh, calmer winds, which if you're flying nighttime is often the case. Uh, daytime applications tends to be when the wind picks up due to the, the sun and the weather patterns. OK. Um, let's see here. Just a few more questions to weed through. I think we'll wrap up with this final one. What are the differences between thermal and uh, near-infrared type imagery? You talked about the uh, not being uh, night vision, but can you speak to some of the differentiations between those two types? Uh, sure. Uh, the near-infrared imagery is a different wavelength. It's closer to the visible spectrum. And what the near-infrared imagery is used for is vegetation mapping. Uh, vegetation is highly sensitive to the near-infrared energy. It's not used as you know, part of photosynthesis, uh, but the cell structure and the plant type will have a dramatic effect. And so what you can do with near-infrared energy or imagery is you can map vegetation types and you can also map uh, vegetation health. And so within a, let's say, a farmer's field, you can look for variability in the field and you could uh, make some conclusions that there's some fertility issues that they need to address, uh, that kind of application. And if you think back to the original application for near-infrared technology, it goes back to the uh, World War One and Two, or Two, I think, where uh, the IR near infrared technology was used to map camouflage, because camouflage is not living vegetation, and therefore would not reflect the energy the same way as a the trees and shrubs around there, and so they could pick out the tanks uh, for that op reason. 
the thermal imagery is different because it is radiating heat, not reflecting energy. And so anything with a but everything has a heat signature, and that's what thermal imagery would be imagery would be used for is mapping the thermal patterns that you see from objects or between objects. And so the applications will be uh, very different, maybe complementary in some cases, uh, but also very different. And so for that reason, you might want to fly both imagery, near infrared and thermal in infrared to combine those data sets like in agriculture where you're looking to assess crop health. You could use the thermal imagery to assess crop health and irrigation management and put those two together as a blended data set. Great. Well, thanks, Aaron, for uh, giving us lots to think about there, both through your presentation and the question and answer. And I want to uh, thank all of our attendees for uh, many of the questions and, and staying with us throughout the entire presentation. I will remind you to check out um, aerialservicesinc.com slash webinars for our upcoming webinars uh, here in the month of June and July and then as we move into the fall. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, don't forget to fill out that survey as you leave the webinar today. Thanks, Aaron. And uh, thank all of you attendees for joining us. Have a good day now.